Welcome to Dear Diaspora, a podcast celebrating the African diaspora and the change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs working to make our world a better one to live in. I'm your host, Ndula Koa. Let's get started. So before I introduce the next guest, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and rate on Apple Podcasts. It makes a huge difference and One key way that it does that is people are more likely to check out an episode or two if they see that there are ratings and if they see that people are actually listening to the content and enjoying the content. And uh, one way to show that you enjoy the content is by leaving a review. So for everyone that's left a review, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you are listening on any other podcast listening platform, please make sure you follow the podcast so you're notified each Sunday when new episodes come out. And lastly, if you're listening on Spotify, you can actually share the podcast that you listen to on Instagram stories, just like you would a song. So if you're listening to Dear Diaspora on Spotify, you can share that in your Insta stories and I will repost. Um, So of course, tag Dear Diaspora and I will repost and really appreciate you spreading the word about the podcast. Happy Sunday, dear Diaspora fam. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 37 of the show. I cannot wait for y'all to listen to today's episode. I had the pleasure of interviewing Amako Chegbu. She is a former senior business analyst at McKinsey & Company and currently works for a new tech startup called Upward as the chief product officer. Amaka was born in Enugu, Nigeria and grew up in Sheffield, England. And after earning her bachelor's degree at Yale, she landed a full-time role at McKinsey & Company as a business analyst. While she was at McKinsey, Amaka co-wrote a compelling report on the future of work in Black America. And we spent the majority of the episode chatting through the insights that were gathered uh, from all the research that she did on that report. Stay tuned to hear more about her upbringing in Sheffield, England, her experience studying and working in the U.S. and really starting to embrace her British Nigerian identity, how she landed her management consulting gig at McKinsey & Company, insights on how automation will impact Black America from the McKinsey article that she co-authored, the types of jobs that are most likely to be displaced by automation, and her new role at this new financial inclusion startup called Upward. And I just can't wait for y'all to listen. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Amaka Chegbu. Amaka, thank you so much for being a guest on Dear Diaspora. I'm so excited to have you. Oh, I'm excited to be on. (laughs) Absolutely. I am so, yeah, looking forward to just learning more about your background and all of your incredible work um, at McKinsey. And let's just start by getting to know a bit more about your background and where you grew up and what your upbringing was like. Sure. Um, So obviously, as you can tell from my name, Amaka, I I am Nigerian. I was born in Enugu um, in the um, kind of southeastern portion of Nigeria. And then I moved over to the UK where I was, where I basically spent the majority of my life growing up. Um, when I was a baby. So I actually don't remember living in Nigeria um, particularly, but um, came over to the UK, uh, moved house a bunch of times. Like my parents were both doctors and, you know, the way it works is you end up like moving to the city that your post is in. Um, But I ultimately ended up in a sort of medium sized city in the north of England called Sheffield, where I spent most of my time um, as a young person. And then for university, that's when I came to the States. I went to Yale and then um, have been in the US ever since. Wow. And what was growing up in Sheffield like for you? Yeah, so it's it's interesting because, um, so I'm not sure um, how familiar you are with um, the UK and the sort of demographics. Like compared to the US, like there are very few black people in the UK. Um, in my, you know, I remember when I growing up and being at school, like the only black people I really knew were my family <laughs> or like, you know, my, my parents, friends who happened to like also have a kid in our school. So it was just like a very um, non black place. And so it was tough as an immigrant trying to 
feel a connection to my home country because like outside of my family I didn't have a really strong sense of what Nigerian culture was like you know my parents you know were very you know strict and firm god-fearing folk and I kind of viewed Nigerian culture as boring and all about church and homework and so it's so funny (laughs) as I which is hilarious looking back but it's so funny as you it's like particularly now when the arts and the music and the culture of Nigeria is really um, particularly among the younger generation is really starting to emerge it's so funny that I used to think that I had like a a boring drab culture it's so ridiculous but um it was it, it was always a challenge to kind of to connect with um n- the cultural elements of being Nigerian but it was also very tough to connect with the cultural elements of like living in the UK you know my parents um didn't grow up in the UK and so as a result there were a lot you know in our home we ate Nigerian food um we called the living room the pala do you know what I mean and when our friends would come over you know I used to always and it sucks because now I'm an adult and I look back and I'm like, I feel like I missed out on enjoying my culture as a young person. But I used to be, you know, always a little bit embarrassed that we were different. And I didn't understand um, how beautiful and exciting difference is. Um, coming to the U.S. was fairly interesting because, you know, I kind of became a, an immigrant twice over. And I think that was when I started to like to really enjoy and um, embrace my African culture honestly as well as my English culture I think that it's one of those things that when you're away from home that's when you really miss it and you appreciate it most Mm. and I think that as you get older and you um, get more confident in yourself you're able to accept the parts of yourself that society doesn't train you to like very much and doesn't train you to uh, be accepting of I remember, um, I don't know, I remember when I came to the US for the first time, you know, not the first time, but the first time properly when I was um, moving in to our dorms at Yale. And we have, we had um, our, like a, a separate orientation for the international students sort of a couple of weeks before, um, before uh, the term started or the semesters uh, started. And and there were different parts of the orientation and one of the parts, there were, there were two that were quite funny. One of them was um, basically teaching us about American culture and sort of what to expect. It was uh, one of the things I told us, if someone says they want to grab coffee with you, they actually don't mean it. Americans are often just like <laughs> really friendly and say things they don't mean. So don't be offended if someone who says, yeah, let's grab, let's grab a meal, like never speaks to you again, which was <laughs> really funny. And also just like how effusive people are, because in England people, we tend to um, be very, very um, um, muted in our responses and very even tempered and not particularly um, histrionic, which is very different to how um, American culture is typically like. So it was interesting learning about, oh, this is this whole other way that people navigate the world and express themselves. And it really, for me, made me, more aware that, you know, within myself and within the more natural ways that I respond to stimuli or just respond to things in the world, that it really is from two countries, you know, Nigeria and the UK, given that, you know, although I grew up in the UK, like my upbringing was very much Nigerian. Um, Yeah, so that was, you know, one of the things that I remember. I remember like we would do like literal role players in those one session (laughs) where they had showed up um, they showed us like slang terms <laughs> and one wow. of them like, my favorite one was thinner like I had never heard thinner before obviously and we, ha- we were asked like what it meant it was like a, a quiz nobody nobody they were like like maybe maybe like a hundred international um like freshmen like pre-frosh or whatever like I'm, like at Yale who nobody could figure out what thinner meant and then we found out that it actually meant fixing to mm-hmm. as in if you're going to do so and everyone was like what like it was just I remember that being just hilarious like no one knew it was it, it's it's awesome it's really cool going to another country when you're very young um and experiencing different culture but I think it's especially nice when you do it at an age where you're able to um where you've you've grown up enough to like love yourself and love where you're from um because that also makes it 
possible for you to like love the new place that you're going to or, or that you are in that moment. Wow, that is so interesting. Uh, that's that's hilarious. The the slang and you know, <laughs> I wouldn't expect that to be like a you know a term that would even come up during like a school orientation. Um, <laughs> but that's. Yeah. that's so funny. Um, and so when you started to kind of get more adjusted into like the U.S. life, did you find yourself having to like explain like, yes, I'm British and Nigerian? Like, was that something that people like got immediately or did you have to like really break it down for them? That's like a really interesting question because I would I remember just getting so frustrated buy this and it's it's actually interesting how it played out like you know you'd be out in the world and someone would be like oh my gosh you know where are you from and I'd be like oh I'm from Nigeria they're like no where are you really from and I'm like dude I'm black <laughs> like and the question they're asking is the accent people are always just so more much more excited about the fact that I'm from the UK than the fact that I'm from Nigeria and it really frustrates me because it's um it's it was a i I've, I'm always so excited to tell people now that I have grown up and I'm and it's a part of my identity that I love as opposed to that like reminds me of doing my homework like I always want to tell people and no people aren't as interested but when you're in the UK and people ask where you're from they're asking like why are you here and so it's so interesting because I think that in the UK versus the US people have very different perceptions of immigration and in the UK you know, I don't know if I'll get shot for saying this, but it's a culturally quite a xenophobic country. Like mm-hmm. there is almost to the point of superseding race. Um, the folks who have been in the UK for longer, um, such as the African immigrants and the Jamaicans, um, have a very different experience than the newer migrants. And so when you come in and you are different, people want to know how British you are. And, and that's why often the where are you really from means what is your um, ethnic origin, which country are you from. Mm. But in the US, my personal experience, obviously very tied to the fact that my accent happens to sound English, people don't seem to be as concerned about what, whether I am from like, about like, honestly, of my like racial background, they're just more excited by, you know, this person is speaking in this funny accent. And I'm very aware that they probably are especially excited seeing a black person speaking in an English accent because, you know, the British sort of vernacular and accent is associated with, you know, being quite fancy and that perhaps it's surprising to see a black person carrying it. So I, and, and it's something that, oh, wow. yeah. you know, I've, I've noticed not just from white folk, but from black folk. Like one guy, I think I was, I think I was at Walgreens, I'd, I got I was grabbing something, I was probably grabbing like nail polish remover or something. And he was like, whoa, I've never heard a black person have a, you know, British accent. And he was so happy. He was like, he, he literally saw it as a point of pride. And he was like, you go get him. And I was like, go get what? <laughs> like, yeah, like, because I think that it's associated with some sort of like fanciness that people aren't used to black, a position people aren't used to black people possessing. And so for white folk, they feel shocked. And for, I think, a lot of African-Americans, like, there is the, I never thought that a black body could, you know, be, could have, like, a different, you know, a connotation of something which isn't always negative. You know, like, like, if I was moving around the world and I had, a like, a southern accent, I think that my experience in the U.S. would be very different than, or even if I was running around with um, a Nigerian accent, like, I think my experience. So the US would be so different. And I and I find it quite fascinating, um, particularly because in the UK, um, immediately it'll be like, why are you here? How long have you been here? It, 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 you know, that, that, that is very much how um, people code, um, you know, belonging in the UK. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's so interesting. Um, it just makes you wonder, like, why... Like, you know, if, if a black person hears another black person speaking with a, a British accent, it's like, why do you perceive them having that accent as like them having some sort of, like you said, like the more fancy, um, you know, background? Like, why 
why is that? Like, why can't we, like, why don't we understand that blackness looks different, like, around the world, you know? I feel like there's probably a lot more um, just awareness or, like, education that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's also just, like, the realities of colonialism and the legacies behind that. And also, you know, the, the if, we, if we trace it back to the ways that Black folk from the continent originally immigrated or migrated to other parts of the world, like, I think there is also the, the view that, you know, it is a different sort of historical path to have been in the U.S. for the past hundred-ish years that have come in quite recently. I, 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 I think part of it, in part, is them sort of hearing the English accent and being aware that perhaps, like, I have somewhat been spared from, you know, the trauma of what it means to have been in the United States as a black person for a long time. And, and just as the very short time that I've been in the U.S., like, I have honestly been really shocked by um, how racism like uh sort of like manifest itself it really is very jarring and so to some extent I think when people hear my accent within the black community and they're surprised I think there's also an element of uh oh so that means you haven't been here as long and perhaps haven't been through a lot of the trauma that folks who have you know grew up for generations in the U.S. have undoubtedly gone through Mm, that's yeah I I totally um understand what you're saying and I would say you know the like you were saying like the legacy of colonialism I feel like there's still a lot of like just deep-seated like anti-blackness um Mm -hmm. in addition um to that and even like back home like I'm from Zambia if you hear someone with a foreign accent it's like ooh like, it's like, so ridiculous it's literally ridiculous I think it's yeah. worse when it's in the African continent because like yeah it, it, it's a whole other thing and I'm I'm I haven't spent enough time unfortunately in Africa to be able to comment on it but it's always kind of been a bit of a frustration to me the how there's a very strong divide between you know returnees and people who have been in Africa for much longer I'm just talking from a perspective of you know you know, our generation coming back to um, Nigeria or, you know, coming back to Africa and there being a very clear difference between those who have always been there and those who are obviously coming in from the West and, you know, have several markers such as a different accent that differentiates us. Absolutely, man. And it's just, this just reminded me of something like, you know, there have been times when I've traveled back home and people like we have our traditional food um which is like our staple is called nshima which is like Mm -hmm. almost like fufu um just made of like cornmeal um but like when I went back home like I've had people ask me like oh um do you want like a fork you know to eat (laughs) to eat your nshima and I'm like no (laughs) like why would I why would I just all of a sudden start using a fork um, you know, wait, who, who would be asking that? Um, I've had a family member, like a, an aunt, um, yeah, try to like ask if I needed a, a fork. Um, and I just was like, I, I just don't understand. <laughs> like, this is something oh that's, God. that's our, you know, part of our culture. We, we eat with our hands. Um, just because I, you know, I, I've grown up in the U S now. Um, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden I can't eat, like enjoy my food or eat with, um, eat with my hands. So it's just things like that, that I'm like, why? Like, (laughs) um, yeah. And I think it's also just the challenge of navigating, like the African culture as a living and, and breathing entity in the face of quote unquote modernism, as you consider, the 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 fact that a lot of people are leaving Africa and coming back. I don't know. I I sometimes, particularly from my parents, I perceived a grappling with how to locate their Nigerian culture um, in relation to British culture in terms of you know what do they leave behind? You know what do they bring? Like 
you know, I, I think it's really, I think that, um, I hope I'm not jumping around too much, but if I look at the, um, the, you know, uh, um, American Trump supporting white folk who are really worried about their culture and how it's changing in the face of migration, I think that a similar existential reckoning um, happened in at least my parents' generation where they saw their culture, you know, in the post-independence era, having to take on a new name as people started interacting with other cultures. Like, does that mean eating with your hands is now old fashioned or like less than, and we should be using spoons and forks? Um, does it mean that, you know, certain like traditions we have are no longer sophisticated and we should, you know, not, te- you know, not teach our children the language lest they, you know, pick up this, you know, accent, which is not refined. I, I think that there is always a really tough reckoning when your culture is, um, inter interacts with another culture where you have to look at it through a very specific lens um, and no longer um, just like interact with it as something which has just been handed to you. You actually have to kind of like, you know, do work with it and figure out, you know, is this like, what are the good things about this culture? What are the things that, you know, I want to change or, you know, things that I want to build onto it. And I think that's sort of what came to mind when you mentioned, you know, that story of a spoon, because, you know, I don't, I don't speak Ibo. I'm Ibo. I don't speak Ibo. And I was very intentionally not taught it. And I think it's very similar to this, you know, Mm. question of what do we do with our culture when we see it, you know, quote unquote, um, being threatened by a different culture? Do we assimilate? Do we embrace it? Or do we, as um, a lot of the um, folks, unfortunately, who um, are on Trump's side of this whole thing, you know, do we reject it aggressively? You know, I, I think I think the clash of cultures is a very complex, complex area. Wow. Wow. That's, it's so interesting that you said um, that you were intentionally not taught Igbo. That's... Oh, we were we were so intentionally not taught, very intentionally not taught. Wow, yeah. I mean, I I totally get it. Um, yeah, growing up, like I spent the first ten years of my life in Zambia, and like my my I was there with my grandma while my mom, like you know, was in the U.S. working. Um, and I grew up around um, you know my family speaking our our language Tonga, but my grandmother would never speak to us really in Tonga. Like she would speak to us in English. Um, I think maybe under the assumption that we just didn't understand it or like, but there was no like intentional effort to make sure that we knew how to speak the language. Um, And even like at school, um, they would um, discourage you from speaking anything other than English. Um, Mm. And so now as an adult, I'm like, I'm trying my best to like hold on to, you know, what I do, um, you know, remember and what I can speak. Um, and I'm like actively like telling my mom, like, please speak to me in Tonga because I don't want to like, <laughs> I don't want to forget and I want to practice. Um, yeah. But it's just so interesting that, you know, we value, you know, English and sounding proper um, more than like holding on to like our culture. Um and that's a blanket statement, obviously, but I'm just saying in probably in, in your case and then in my case. Um, but yeah, just yeah. interesting things. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's very generational and very political because I think people our age feel very differently about that. A lot of us are trying to learn our language, our native language for the first time. And I think that it's just the, the, um, the negotiation that people have between their, their culture and the cultures of others you know perhaps in our parents generation the viewers let's assimilate and let's you know you know not not, not, not necessarily intentionally but like it's not a big deal but for us now at least you know I have friends who say they will only you know my my, uh, Latin American Latin Latin whatever Latin friends will often say that they're they only want to date someone who could speak Spanish because they want their children to speak Spanish, you know, which is so fantastic and great. And, you know, you know, I'm literally, you know, I, I say I should, I haven't got around to it, but I truly want to learn how to speak Ibo because I would, I would hate for that language to 
like disappear from my lineage because I haven't taught it. But my parents obviously weren't thinking about it in the same intentional way. I, you know, I think it's very um, political, very generational and, and, you know, does does change. You know, just, just responding to your uh, comment about, you know, the the blanket nature of the statement. You know, I think that, you know, you're completely right in that, you know, there are nuances to it. Man, th- I mean, thank you for being super open and um, vulnerable about that because that's um, it's not an easy thing I don't think to talk about Um, but yes definitely appreciate that Um, so let's let's talk more about uh, what it was like for you uh, going to school at Yale and graduating and landing like your first full-time gig like what was that experience like for you yeah like for me um, I don't honestly was like a fairly straightforward experience and I feel very grateful for that um back when I was graduating which is obviously very different for the young folk who are not I need to stop saying that but for the people who are graduating now who were maybe two or three years um, younger than me like back when I was graduating there were jobs (laughs) and 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 you would pick one and you'd be okay Um, and so I remember back then I the way I thought about it was um I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do yet but I knew I wanted to do something important there were kind of two things on my mind firstly like doing something which like had a important and significant impact was extremely important to me um I felt that not everyone gets the opportunities that I've happened to have like you know there's a lot of hard work there's a lot of luck and there's a lot of literal just you know you know literally the people around you have such an incredible impact on what you're able to achieve. And I you know, always and still do tell myself that I want to use the um, opportunities that I've had to do something like very, very significant and important. So when I was looking for different job opportunities, it was in my mind, like, where can I make a significant impact? And that was number one. And then the number two was um, learning. I think what's really tough often is that a lot of organizations don't value young people very much and don't give them enough work to do. Um, I think that when you're in your early 20s, that's when you're the hungriest, that's when you're the most insecure and you have the most approved. And I wanted to, and I knew that, and I wanted to put that energy into learning as much as possible um, as opposed to um, doing like, you know, you know, you know how I don't know what an investment banker does, so no shade. But like, I don't want to be like catching typos and powerpoints and staying up till like three a.m. to be someone's lackey. You know, I wanted to actually be learning as much as possible. So um, quite naturally, it, um, the when I was looking at jobs, I kind of thought about. I actually thought about two things: journalism and management consulting, which sound very, very different, but really are not if you think about it in a certain way. Um, so I wrote for the Yale Daily News, which was our campus daily paper, like throughout college. And I just loved journalism and the idea of, you know, telling stories that other people aren't able to tell themselves and kind of empowering voices in that way. And so I applied for a bunch of newspapers, um, you know, had like actually an offer at the Boston Globe that I was excited about. Um, and that was kind of one route of job searching that I was doing. But at the same time, I was also thinking about um, the management consulting space, mainly because the, you know, it looked really cool to work on like a massive range of different projects, which were necessarily super important, like for a corporation or a government or a foundation to hire consultants to work on a problem that problem by default is like the most important thing it is you know one of the three things that the ceo you know keeps them up at night you know that kind of stuff and so i felt like this would be an excellent exposure to working on things which are super impactful whilst also learning a lot um it's interesting because when you think about like cultures of different organizations um because i was very fortunate to be graduating in a time where there were a lot of um companies hiring um, I was able to really take culture into perspective. Um, one of my, not one of my, like my um, best friend works at a very, very um, well-known hedge fund, which has a very specific culture, which, um, you know, for me, when I was kind of going through the application process, I sort of asked myself, what kind of leader do I want to ultimately become? Um, because when you when you look at the people around you, whether you intend to or not, you will pick up their habits. And so it was very I was very particular about 
choosing a company where the leaders of that company were aspirational and that I wanted to copy them and learn from them and become like them through osmosis. Like I didn't want to go to somewhere where I'll pick up bad habits and become a, a douche. Do you know what I mean? Like, cause that happens to the best of people. And so ultimately I found myself at McKinsey and, um, I did a summer internship there, loved it and then joined full time. So, um, so in terms of, in terms of landing that first job, like I really want to put the, the kind of economic context, you know, into the picture and flag that that was a very different time, unfortunately, and that today it's much harder for people graduating from university to find jobs just because of how everything's in disarray. But um, I think the, the, the things that really helped me that I think still stand now are um, really taking culture into consideration and really like showing your full self at, you know, recruiting events and when you're um, speaking to um you know, hiring managers and stuff, because at the end of the day, like people are just people. And when you meet someone you click with, it's great. Like one of the people that my interviewers at McKinsey, actually my first round interviewers, um, is one of like my biggest like mentors of the firm. Ultimately we became really, really good friends just from me just being myself, obviously like a polished and put together version of myself. Like I wasn't just like like wilding out but just being my actual self and then you know people engage with that and if you're not someone's cup of tea it's fine but people always respect when you're authentic and so I would I would kind of almost first and foremost say you know like you know a guiding thought really is authenticity and being as true to yourself as possible because that counts even when you're very young and then secondly just like doing the hustle doing the grind going to all the networking events figuring out who are the people who you should talk to going and introducing yourself, knowing it's awkward and it'll feel weird following up, like, you know, reading about doing your homework in advance. So it's clear that you, you know, you know, those sorts of stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm really just in this, just trying to be as helpful as possible, given um, understanding that people who may be job hunting now are job hunting in a very different um, economic setting, but um, landing my first full-time job, like, was fortunately quite straightforward. Um, but those are the kind of learnings that I think may be applicable for people now. Absolutely. Um, thank you for touching on that. That's It's certainly um, a difficult time right now because um, mm-hmm. even with my work at OHA, we work to you know connect students to opportunities. Um, but now a lot of you know summer internships are being canceled. Companies are not sure if they can handle having like remote teams or remote interns. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's just like a really tricky time. Um, and then especially for like people graduating this semester, I, I definitely feel for um, a lot of students. I had the pleasure of um, meeting you through my job and learning about your work on the future of work in black America. Um, that is such an excellent report and, um, is definitely, it's definitely interesting to read it, um, given like all of our current conditions now and just how COVID has like impacted lots of our jobs. And I would just love to learn more about what all went into putting that report together. Sure, sure. So, um, I'll give you a bit of background on the report. So basically, you know, for folks who haven't yet read it, what, we did it, McKinsey as part of um, our Black Economic Forum that we um, host each year as we wanted to do a report on the impact that automation would have on the African-American workforce specifically. Um, this is a, with the backdrop of um, obviously automation is going to affect everybody. A lot of jobs will be impacted, but we had a hypothesis that Um, black folk in the US would be impacted disproportionately. So we wanted to do some additional research, like really, really granular and careful research. And ultimately what we were able to produce was analysis on basically the jobs that would be growing by, you know, we we did a um, conservative sort of midpoint forecast of what jobs would look like in 2030, which means all the technology that exists today already you know, only modeling the impact of that technology, not thinking about what happens if cars fly, like, just literally what we have right now, and basically seeing which jobs um, would be growing by 2030, which jobs likely will suffer a lot of displacement, 
And also we managed to get that at a pretty geographically um, detailed level. So we went county by county, um, ultimately lumping, um, ultimately, you know, aggregating them into archetypes for ease, but we did the county by county analysis. We were able to see patterns of jobs, which were, as I said, growing and not growing and also um, the patterns of job displacements and impacts of automation by subgroups within the African-American community. So we looked at how women versus men will be, um, will sort of be impacted and also um, intersections such as whether or not someone has a college degree. Um, so so that that is just like an overall view of the research that we did. And um, yeah, so... Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you kind of drive in terms of the findings you're most interested in, because it was just like, it was like, honestly, the most fun, awesome project like I ever worked on. The data was just absolutely fascinating. And so like I could speak at length about any one of the um, topic areas that we deep dived into during the report. Wow, absolutely. Um, I think it was super interesting to read Um that black women in particular might fare better um, due to like some of the roles that a lot of black women in America have. Um, mm -hmm. So like the caregiving roles, working in the healthcare field, being nurses, nurse assistants. Um, and so could you speak more to that and like why black women might, you know, fare better in comparison to, to black men? Yeah. So this is this was like an absolutely fascinating insight. So ultimately what we saw, let me just give kind of like an aggregate view, is that the types of jobs most likely to be displaced by automation. And he uses the word displaced very intentionally because, you know, jobs will obviously be lost, be lost, but some jobs will be replaced. So, so we talk about job displacements um, um, just from a, a language standpoint. And what we saw with that, a lot of the jobs which were most likely to be impacted were you know, repetitive tasks, which um, don't necessarily have a lot of human interaction or human contact um, needed from sort of an interpersonal and cognitive standpoint. Um, they were the types of jobs which perhaps, you know, um, require physical ability, such as being a stock, being like a, you know, a stock clerk and like filling shelves on a, um, at a, at a supermarket, like jobs which really are physical in nature were the ones most likely to be displaced obviously because machines are also physical in nature <laughs> do you know what I mean like that's you know what we found um however the types of jobs which were more resistant were jobs which a machine really at least right now can't do jobs which require empathy and 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 care and nuance and being able to kind of um work with people in a way in which you're which is based on establishing trust and as it happens a lot of the jobs that women do like you know regardless of race tend to be those types of roles like the ways that um you know teaching and being a nurse you know that kind of thing tends to be very very gendered already but in addition um given the aging population healthcare in particular is a space which will need just more um um you know human power and more I'm about to say manpower and i was like that's pretty ironic but you know it will need more folks to do it just because more people are living longer and that kind of intersection is really why a lot of the jobs that right now black women do at higher numbers like being nursing assistants personal care aides you know vocational nurses you know those sorts of ancillary um, medical um, medical support roles um, really are growing a lot and as it happens those are the roles that black women are in however I think that the more ex interesting finding that I found in that space is even though we as black women are already positioned in jobs which are set to grow um, come 2030, um, we happen to be in the jobs that are paid the least, but set mm -hmm. to grow. Um, so if you look at things such as registered nurses and elementary school teachers, those are jobs which are also growing, but typically dominated by um, non-black women, like, mm. you know, white women and so what we're finding is that you know sure we're not going to lose our jobs but as a as a race we're not going to be growing in wealth if these patterns persist so um around the the intersection of race and gender i think something which is really important is as um for black women who perhaps are in these roles or are thinking of entering these roles is like really think about upskilling do you know what i mean really think about the fact that 
there are there are going to be gaps in the market which need to be filled. Let it be us that fills them because this is a great opportunity. You know, fantastic. We have jobs. We're not going to be suffering by from like large scale unemployment as much as our male counterparts will be doing. But we kind of need to do more. We want to get ourselves from medical support to like medical roles. And I think that was something that for me was really um, important and empowering to hear that, you know, I'm, I'm even looking at, I'm, I have one of the charts up in front of me just because like, I just, I just love the numbers in this. I, I look at the teaching assistant versus teachers. We need to get ourselves being teachers and not teaching assistants. That, that, that's kind of, I think, the most important thing. And then on the male side of things, the picture is extremely bleak. It is a very, very bleak, bleak, bleak picture. Um, because if we think about the types of roles that men do, you know, truck drivers, you know, those sorts of like laborers, like the, t- the tough thing is the growing jobs right now are in tech. Do you know what I mean? And those and black people are very underrepresented in tech. And it happen- so it happens that men, are, oh, like if you look at just like the male world, you know, it looks like males are really well positioned for the future because they're doing all of this, like, you know, software and blah, 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 whatever. But like for us as um, the black community, we're not in that space. Mm. So uh, so there are two answers to that. There is obviously we need to get in that space. But obviously I'm aware that that's like not everyone is able to like go get a engineering degree today if you're like, 44 and like a parent to like three kids like that probably isn't what you're going to do but I think one of the things that I found was that we're going to have to really start um, as a community trying to remove the gendered lens on jobs if we want to remain in a job and what I mean is that there are certain southern counties that I that I can recall that perhaps don't have any growing roles at all in things that a man would traditionally feel was a male role. And so they may have to consider things such as nursing. They may have to consider things such as being, such as teaching, things which perhaps traditionally were perceived as feminine. And we're going to have to accept that the gender distribution of labor is ridiculous. And not only is it something that's harmful for everyone, it is specifically harmful for men because it's actually in their best interest to like um, to, to to be less um, um, patriarchal in this particular space. Wow! Wow! Super, just fascinating um, and important um, insights. Yeah, we definitely. Um, I love what you said. You know, ins- let's not be the teaching assistants. Let's be the teachers. Let's um, not be the nursing assistants. Let's be the the registered nurses or the doctors. Um, And clearly that's, it's easier said than done um, because Mm -hmm. there's a lot of work um, that, you know, it would take a lot of work for someone to just, you know, switch and all of a sudden say, okay, I'm enrolled in a a four year nursing program. Like that's, um, it's not the easiest thing to do, um, but it's Mm -hmm. definitely, it's definitely important to, to just be, thoughtful about um if you do have the opportunity to upskill or you know just get more education um you you know it's almost like you have no choice if you want to be able to uh, make sure that you you're taken care of your families are taken care of and um, you have the opportunity to to build you know that multi-generational wealth um Mm -hmm. yeah and I'd love to um, hear about your thoughts on like just everything happening right now, um, you know, with this pandemic and, you know, how so many people are losing their jobs, particularly, you know, people in the retail space, stores are closing, like hairstylists and, you know, people that own salons, like they're not able to do their, their work. Um, and so, yeah, I just love to just hear what your thoughts are on that. Okay, well, I'll begin by caveating that, you know, these are my personal opinions, um, not the opinions of my employer. So I think that's just important to kind of get out of the way. But um, so it, it's a, it's an extremely tough, extremely tough economic situation. Um, some talk about this feeling like it's the start of a recession. Others refer to this perhaps being the start of a depression. Like, I, like I, I think the language doesn't matter. I think we can just accept that this is going to be very tough for some time. We don't know for how long, but we know it's it's going to happen. And in terms of the, you know, the patterns of job displacements that we are seeing right now, I think there are two categories, right? I think there are some things which are 
due to COVID, which are on pause and will resume. And the challenge is, you know, will the previous players be able to re-enter in terms of like, do they have enough liquidity? What I'm talking about is like, in my opinion, I think that after this is over, the first place I'm going to go to is the hair salon to get my hair fixed because it looks crazy. I'm going <laughs> to go to the restaurant and eat a nice dinner because like, you know, I like doing nice things and I hate that I'm not able to do them right now. Like that's the first thing I'm going to do. Am I going to be going into like a like a physical brick and mortar Sephora? Probably not. Am I going to go to like, you know, Starbucks and stand and wait in line? No, I'm, I've actually quite liked this idea of, you know, digitally ordering food and groceries and stuff. And like, you know, you know, like a spot that used to be a great physical convenience structure that I could walk past on my way to work. Like, um, like I'm just going to navigate, I'm just going to interact with those types of um, businesses differently. So I think that there are, there are roles which are on pause, which will come back. And I think there are roles which were on their way out and will just, you know, die faster. And I think that unfortunately, like um, brick and mortar retail is one of those. I don't think that that's a bad thing for ordinary workers. I think it's, I think it sucks if you are the um, CEO of whatever, like, large retail corporation i think that's probably like not great but if you're an ordinary working person you are able to pivot and you are able to do something different and i think that often people don't have enough information in terms of like the um vulnerability of the roles that they're in and people don't realize that they have skills which could actually perhaps pay them better somewhere else so for example like we know that folks who are like you know cashiers you know working in stores like right now um Obviously, there are a lot of health issues and challenges around working there. But like we know that being a cashier is something which is in the process of being replaced by machines. Um, given COVID, it will be replaced faster by, by some, rather than slower. And so what I think that means is that people sort of what we need to do is think about our skills and where else we can apply them. Because if we think perhaps of the space of you know customer service, you you need a person to like, you know, negotiate with like an angry customer who's ready to switch off their AT&T service and convince them not to like that needs a human being the skill set isn't super different from being a cashier at least according to um Onet which is a um, company that does like skills comparisons upon other things um you could transition obviously there'll be some reskilling required you could transition and you will almost definitely earn more money so I think that people need to view this as like um an opportunity for what unfortunately is a forced career change but a career change that perhaps needed to happen because I think in this space a lot of vulnerable industries are dying quicker I think there are and and, and, and yeah I think a lot of vulnerable industries are dying quicker there are some which are on pause which will need to be revived but um you you, you just you, you like no 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 one will give you a Nobel Prize for the insight that you know like working a cash register is not going to be something that is like sustainable. And I think that also, um, at least for me, I think that this is an incredible opportunity given how entrepreneurial black women are in particular for us to use this time as a, and this like, this like state of rupture as as the time to like build and grow new things. I think that Right now, nobody really knows what the quote unquote new economy is going to look like. We just know it will be different. And I think that for folks who are part of the life and blood of like the world and, you know, consumer age, like we perhaps know because we're normal people. We know where the world is going a bit better than all of these like, you know, scientists and, and corporate executives and stuff who are trying to predict the future. They're probably not as good at predicting the future as ordinary folk on the ground who are like living and breathing it. And so I feel as though the, you know, I, I, and I just, I just think it's more productive to, um, to comment on like what we can do. And I think what we can do is try to build the future that we think our neighbors and our brothers and sisters and our colleagues need as a, you know, and, and, One of those, one way to do that, obviously, is through entrepreneurism, which I think that people should really consider deeply right now. Um, And also just, like I said, previously taking inventory of the skills and experiences you have and seeing where else can they apply. Um, Mm. But like, you know, I, I think at this point, it's just so important just to underscore like, you know, healthcare is something when you would be a growing space. And right now we are so fortunate 
due to the bravery and selflessness of the healthcare workers right now who are obviously putting their lives on the line to kind of get us all through it. You know, the economy could almost feel like a bit of a secondary question given the very immediate risk to human health which is going on right now. You know, like both all my, my both my parents and all my siblings who are like not babies, I have two baby siblings, but the ones who aren't babies are all doctors or medical students and they're out there um, on the front lines fighting COVID. And so I'm very aware that the economy is just one of many questions that need to be answered, but I still think it's an important question. I think that um, the answer to how people can protect their jobs or at least protect their employability in this, as I said, this this um, context of quite severe rupture is to think about what else their skills can do if they're in a position where they're in a job which is not actually as as secure as they thought it was. Mm. Thank you for that. And um, I'm curious. So I know this. Um, I know this report came out last fall. Um, correct. Mm-hmm. Yep, it did. And so, how do you how do you go about getting this information out to like regular folks? Like, I know, like it's probably been shared with um, you know yeah. policy makers or you know just different government government officials or just influential people with power um but how like how do we get the word out to like the cashiers or you know to people with jobs that might not be as secure um like how do we spread this information i think that's such a great question and such an important one um you're so right often when um people do research, they kind of spread it around to the other ivory towers and like don't actually share it with the people who need to know it. Great question. So a few things. So firstly, I think that like um, a lot of this information is on the radars of a lot of nonprofits and community organizations that work directly with people in peacetime, in normal time. You know, you probably aren't interacting with a nonprofit, like you, you just most people just honestly aren't um right now i think people are right now people need services and need like like emergency relief people don't understand how to access their stimulus checks some people have like the legal you know i think a lot more people are interacting with community organizations now than they were previously and i think that the answer is really making sure these organizations have this information and um for people who are I don't know, like need help figuring out how to access their, you know, unemployment benefits, letting them know at that point being, oh, by the way, as you're thinking about jobs, these are the jobs which perhaps suit your skill set will be growing in, you know, the new economy or in the future. Oh, and also they probably you know, pay a bit better than you're being paid now. I think that's the kind of information that people need to get. And I think that the... Um, the, the disruption due to COVID and the fact that a lot of people are having to cling to resources they never really referred to beforehand is an opportunity to actually get that information out there. And I think secondly, like within the black community, um, like it's a bit different from, at least in my perception, different from sort of the mainstream um, Caucasian community in that even if, you know, I as an individual happen to have attended an Ivy League university and like have this whatever job. Um, not everyone in my extended family is in the same situation. Like generational wealth hasn't really happened in the black community in the same way it has in in the white community, right? So like I personally have a lot of connections, perhaps not in my immediate family, the world like the world I'm in the UK, um, but like in my extended family, like I have like very direct connections with people who would benefit from hearing this information and I'm able to personally share that. And I think that a lot of um, black folk who have had the privilege of doing well for themselves, I think more often than not, they are very deeply and closely connected with people who've had a different set of opportunities put their way. So I think that for us, like really um spreading things through our own networks is actually a lot more powerful than we would think and also a lot more powerful than like your traditional like white picket fence with Doria Lane person you know because for them everyone you know you know what I mean like generational wealth just hasn't really kicked in mm. to the black community but as a result we're actually way more connected to one another and a lot less siloed than than among white folk and I know just for me myself like you know when I'm out and about obviously not now but back 
back before all this shutdown happened when I'd be out and about, you know, you know, at a bar or whatever, you know, you chat to different people. Like, you know, if someone's telling me they're like a bookkeeping clerk, I'm like, dude, I'm like, don't do, don't be a bookkeeping. <laughs> like, I, I, I say it to folks, like, and I think that we have to realize that, you know, there's a ton that institutions can do. And, you know, it's great that people are probably interacting more with these institutions and, and agencies given the crisis. But like, as individuals, there's a ton that we can do just to tell other people. And we're just so connected um, socioeconomically to people from all different, like, like walks of life that, you know, I think word of mouth is stronger than people think. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a great point. And um, I would say people will probably listen to a family member talk about these things um, and, you know, be able to, like, receive the information. Um, they'd probably do that better than, you know, just seeing, like, an ad or something or just getting a flyer from a nonprofit. Um, yeah. So... Yeah. Thank you for that. That's super important, man. And so what is your, um, so with all like the, the government interventions, um, to try and, you know, um, give people some sort of relief during this time, is there anything in the report that you've, that you're like, oh my gosh, we need to be doing this right now. Or do you think we're responding well? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure anyone would say that we're responding well from like a United States standpoint. Like I, like I, I, I think it's obvious that we're not. And I think the reason why it's obvious is that the reason why these random states in the South are trying to reopen is because, you know, they're not crazy, rational people. They just have no money and they need to go make some money. And like the, the stimulus, as everyone has seen, has disproportionately benefited larger corporations and like left ordinary working people out to dry like that's like a that's like a huge issue um in terms of trying to connect it to the report um one a lot of the things we sort of recommended so the report was very much about labor and employment and employment and what we recommended was you know what we really need are solutions which really cross um the different like 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 um like sections of 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 the sort of of governance right we not only need government involvement we need government involvement in concert with private sector involvement in concert with non-profit involvement in concert with you know like what we really need is a very multifaceted approach to um um to rebuilding the economy right and um something which is really interesting that i think um is quite pertinent right now is that We're in a place where we're in a situation where politically people are very polarized. And as a result, like information isn't heard in the same way it used to be. Like there's a lot of concerns Mm. about real facts and fake news and disinformation and misinformation and apps. You know, like what we're seeing is a space where no one really knows what to believe and nobody really believes anyone's in charge. So they're out running wild doing their own thing and I think that the main thing that I would sort of take that we sort of like indicated to in the report that in my opinion obviously these are my own opinions um we really want to consider right now is just the interconnectedness and the need for connection in our solution like it's no good for the private sector to be the bad guy and like I don't know the Democrats to be the good guys and like them to be at war and like that just that just isn't going to work. We really need a coordinated response. And I think if we look around the world, the countries which have fed the best are the ones which have had coordinated coordinated um, responses and also have um, been able to put polarization politically um, on a back burner. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, Yeah, I think it's just, it's so interesting that almost everything that we do becomes like a, like a Democrats versus Republican thing. You know, maybe the Democrats are are more progressive and they're more cautious and want people to, you know, stay home longer. And then maybe the more right leaning folks are like, yeah, and if if, if I can jump in, they wanted people to stay home longer, but they're not saying enough about how people are going to afford to stay home. Like, mm. that, I, th- I think that's, I think 
both sides are missing key parts of dialogue and they are demonizing the folks who perhaps have the answers to that. Like it shouldn't be a small business versus big business situation where we all need to come together to some extent. Sorry, I interrupted. That was so rude. No, 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 not at all. I mean, that's, that's a, a, <sighs> totally a great point. Um, and it's just, I think it's sad when like we need to be talking about like the real issues and, and real solutions, but then it's like, it just gets so messy and, you know, it just, like you said, it gets super just polarized. And um, I just hope that we're able to continue to, you know, push through this and, um, you know, compromise and understand each other and put like our, our humanity and our health um, just before anything else. Um, Wow. And so you did like, you know, really great work um, on this report. And yeah, thank you for everything that you you and your team did to put it together. Um, so I'm curious, like, what's what's next for you? Like, what other sort of um, projects would you like to, to get into in the future? Or, um, you know, are there any other um, large issues impacting um, people that you'd like to do some more research on or investigate? Yeah, so um, so I really loved the work that I did on the future of work. And just like while at the firm, while at McKinsey, like the work that really excited me was work that I felt really drove real, tangible, incremental change for ordinary people. Um, so right now I'm actually, you know, I'll be leaving the firm in the next few weeks to uh, move on to um, a uh, some more entrepreneurial res- pursuits, like um, I'll be joining a very early stage startup, basically um, co-founding a company. I can't speak too much about it right now, just given where we are um, in terms of, you know, patent filing and, you know, we're like very, very early stage. And so in the startup community, you call it like being in stealth mode. I think it's a ridiculous term, but we're in Mm -hmm. stealth mode, so I can't speak too much. But um, what I can say is in the financial inclusion space. And um, we're trying to basically figure out ways that we can help actually build an engine for generational wealth in you know low and middle income communities who have not been able to um sort of um take advantage of like a flywheel of compounding wealth from past generations so um i'll I'll probably just leave it there but um moving in the very very near future like in a matter of a few weeks to this brand new startup wow that's that's so exciting um, congratulations. And, um, you know, maybe this, that could be another episode in the future. Um, you talking more about that. Um, wow. And I'm always, I'm always like curious about, um, people, you know, of African descent or people that were born on the continent. Like, like, do you have, um, do you have like any sort of desire to like ever like return back home or, um, just do, you know, something back home. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and just maybe what excites you about Africa's future. Yeah, absolutely. So like, I like very deeply within, like, as I think about like the longer term progression of my career, like it is extremely meaningful and important to me that I give back to Nigeria's economy. Um, as I'm sure everyone is aware of, we're a country packed, packed, packed full of entrepreneurial, hardworking, hustling people. I mean, when I watched Hamilton and, you know, they got that, you know, oh, like my country, we're young, whatever, scrappy and hungry. I was like, oh, you mean my country? (laughs) Do you know (laughs) what I mean? Like, that's that's literally how I view it. So I feel like um, I'm, what I'm so excited about is just like, the fire in the bellies of the youth out in Nigeria and obviously in Africa in, in general. And, um, and so just like, so, so I do see myself um, being a part of the economy. Like I'm not exactly sure how, like, you know, I would love to like start a business out in Africa. Everyone says they do. Like I really, really would love to, but I don't have any immediate plans to do that. But um, it's, you know, if I almost recall one of the things I started off with, um, it took a while to like really internalize my culture and to love it. Like I missed out on the colorfulness and the excitement and just like the cool factor of 
of, of Nigeria. Like, you know, when I grew up, I, you know, it was to me just because I didn't know many other Nigerians outside of my house. Like it didn't feel as eclectic and fun and exciting and as cool as I've grown to realize that it is. And so one of the things that also just makes me, what makes me really excited about um, Africa's future is just like where we may exist in terms of popular cultural culture more globally. Like it's mm-hmm. such a basic thing to say, but I just like, I love Afrobeats and I love that there is an Afrobeats. And I just love that, like, I can, like, see my culture, like, popping and being cool and just, like, being awesome and existing in the world and not being presented in either a lens of perpetual poverty and, like, terror or in a lens of just, like, being extremely old-fashioned and conservative and, like, Mm. overly focused on, like, harmful ideals about what family structure should look like. I just just like to see... I, I just am excited about how the youth are really, like energizing what it means to be African and are making, you know, folks like myself, like prouder and prouder by the day to be from the African continent. Man, I love that. I love that. Uh, It's always so interesting because everyone pretty much on that question, everyone says, oh, young people, like it's it's the young people. It's, you know, uh, the we are or, you know, African young people are, you know, really shaping um, what, like, our perceptions of, you know, what Africa is, um, right now, and they're, they're shifting, like, the narrative, and they are, you know, super innovative, and just creative, and, um, I think it's, it's definitely, like, an interesting time, and I, I I also am super excited to just see, um, just, what we all do like in you know these next uh, few decades um so thank you so much for sharing that if people want to just learn more about you or connect with you or just chat about the report like how how can people get in contact with you sure so like um my linkedin um like if you just search my name on linkedin you'll you'll find me like there aren't too many Amaka Uchek Buza at McKinsey, actually. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm, I happen to not be super big on, in, on social media. I am on Instagram, but that is like my personal Instagram. But yeah, it, it's tough. So people can get in touch with, with me, honestly, through LinkedIn. That's like the most professional channel. Absolutely. Yes. I'll make sure to um, link to your LinkedIn profile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Wow, Amaka, thank you so much for being a guest. This was such just an important and interesting conversation. Um, so definitely grateful for, you know, the time you took to, to come on the show. Cool. Awesome. And I, had a, I really enjoyed our conversation. This was awesome. Thank you so much for tuning into episode 37 of the show. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Amaka. I certainly did and just learned so much and Please take a look at the show notes to find out how you can connect with Amaka and then also read the report on the future of work in Black America. If you haven't already, join the Dear Diaspora mailing list. Every month I am going to be sending out a newsletter just providing an update on the podcast, the really great guests that you know I have the pleasure of interviewing, and also just some business resources and different just news and developments from the continent and around the world. So link to that is in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening to Dear Diaspora. If you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at Dear Diaspora or visit our website at DearDiasporaShow.com. Thank you and talk to you next week.